So let's uh, get going. So our talk today is uh, about the Stearns Estate and the race to save the Irvington Woods. And, and as you'll hear, as this tells a kind of a, as Veronica said, a kind of a long and I think very rich history about our village, which is, um, uh, which I think is a great one. And the Stearns Estate, just to kind of put it in context for everybody, the Stearns Estate extends from broad, extended from Broadway out to Mountain Road. And this is a map of Irvington from 1901. And you'll see in the middle, there's a pink area which says Isaac Stern on it. That was the Stearns Estate. And again, it ran from Broadway on the left, right across the street from the Presbyterian Church, out through all the way up to what on the map is shown as Hill Road, but is Mountain Road. And, uh, and this property has a real special history in the village. It was largely owned by only three families, the Ellis family and the Richards family and the Stern or Stearns family from 1849 to 1963, quite a, you know, 120 years or so, 100, about 115 years. Uh, in 1963, the remaining members of the Stearns family conveyed a large part of the western half of the estate to the Union Free School District number two. And this parcel now includes Irvington's high school and middle school, just to kind of put it in juxtaposition. But for the next 40 years, from 1963 up to 2003, Debate raged over whether and how to develop the rest of the estate and whether to follow the trends in the other parts of the village to build new and expanded housing or to protect and maintain the land as a recreational preserve. And, um, and I think what you'll hear is that today's village as we know it is a reflection of this history and the decisions and the choices and the hard work done by so many people along the way have left us with a really remarkable legacy for our village and something that we can all take real advantage of. So let's uh, see if I can get this going. Thank you, second folks. So let's um, start. We're gonna move back to the, again, the foundings of the, the village of Irvington, which was founded in 1849 or 1850 as the village of Dearman. And at that time, um, several of the nearby farms that had been purchased after the, re after the Revolutionary War were sold off as country estates to the new wealthy in New York. And at that time, uh, make, sure everyone, make sure everyone's, everyone, make sure everyone's still on. I just heard a crackle, but I'm going to assume everyone can still hear what I'm saying. Um, let me check something. Yes, okay, so at, the, at that time, uh, Jabaz Ellis, a wealthy merchant who was Charles Tiffany's partner, he purchased the northern half of what had been the old Dutcher farm, which was just north of today's Main Street and extended all the way from the Hudson River to almost the Sawmill River. And for those of you who've been to our prior lectures know that the Dutcher farm had been purchased by William Dutcher after the Revolutionary War. Stern's um, property. Could I, could I ask whoever has their mic on to just put themselves on mute? I'd appreciate it, thanks. So um, the, William Dutcher purchased the old Dutcher farm from the commissioners of forfeiture in uh, 1785. And in 1817, he sold the southern half of that farm to Justice Dearman. And that southern half of the farm, especially the western part, is became what is today downtown of Main Street of Irvington. Jabez Ellis purchased the northern half of the old Dutcher farm. And, um, and he was, again, one of the new merchants and the wealthy merchants of New York who were looking for an escape from the city during the summers. But by the mid 1850s, however, Ellis was facing a lot of financial problems. And in 1857, he sold his farm, his entire farm to his brother, Ira Ellis, who was a shoe store owner in Quartonkin, Rhode Island who then the next day turned around and resold it to uh, Olive Bacon Ellis, who was Jabez Ellis's wife. And that was a fairly common technique used at the time to keep property outside the reach of creditors, um, such so that any creditors of Jabez Ellis couldn't attempt to put a lien or seize the farm uh, to get payment of his debts. 
Um, Ellis and his wife borrowed heavily, however, over the next several years from a lot of sources, and they heavily mortgaged their farm, which eventually led them to have to kind of break it up and sell it. So in um, May of 1863, Jabez and Ellis, Olive Ellis sold all of their property in Irvington between the Hudson River and Broadway to Charles Tiffany and James Dunham. And, and again, this is a map, if you were at our last talk, you've seen this is a map of what became the kind of Tiffany Park or Tiffany Estate. And the pink area is, was the northern half of the um, Ellis Farm or the old Dutcher Farm between Broadway, which is the yellow road on the right, and the Hudson River on the left. And this, um, Charles Tiffany and James Dunham built beautiful big homes there. It became known as Tiffany Park. And then it, this land was later bought by the Mathesons and later became Matheson Park and remained known as the Matheson Park uh, neighborhood today. About six or seven years later, Jabez and Olive Ellis finally sold off the remaining property that made up their farm, which is all east of Broadway. And they sold it to Augustus C. Richards, the New York City resident partner for a company called J.W. Page & Co., a general agent for cotton and woolen mill, mills in New England. And at this time in the 1850s and 1860s and 1870s, uh, there were a substantial number of cotton mills and wool mills still throughout New England. It was before all the mills moved south uh, later in the century. And they all needed to get their products to market and they would work through these uh, general agents that were located either in Boston or in New York. And those general agents um, made a lot of money and Augustus Richard was one of those people who made a lot of money. And in this map, which is from 1872, you will see again on the left that you see Post Road, that's Broadway in the middle. On the left is the Tiffany estate. And on the right is the uh, A.C. Richards estate. Um, and that extends further to the east, to the right as well. And on the map in blue, you'll see the um, little area for the Presbyterian Church. At this time, the Presbyterian Church had property on the east side, on the right to Broadway, and also on the left side. And we'll talk about that history in a, in a minute or two. Now, Augustus Richard um, looked at this new property, this new uh, uh, farm he had purchased is really his country estate. And, and so after purchasing his property, he asked the very famous architect, Alexander Jackson Davis, to assist in designing a grand home that he was gonna build on this estate called Ridgeview. And uh, this is a picture of that Ridgeview home, which is this large home on the hill, essentially where the high school is today. And it looked out all over the Hudson. And um, Richards had previously owned and built a large castle in the very Northern tip of New York, also situated high above the, the Hudson. And he had had in the early 1850s, also had Alexander Jackson Davis help him design that home. That was a big castle and it was later known as Libby Castle. That castle was ultimately purchased by John D. Rockefeller and torn down and became what is today Fort Tyron Park and the Cloisters, the museum of um, the Metropolitan Museum's uh, branch called the Cloisters. So Augustus Richard was very into having these grand views um, of high above the Hudson where he kind of look out at the horizon. And this is a photograph of his house. It was probably taken in 1875 or so. And this is uh, the, the right hand of this house that kind of that's more lit up is um, faces west. And you can see it's an afternoon sun facing the house. And again, it had this beautiful porch, uh, which you can see on the right hand side and this grand view of all um, uh, of the Hudson River. Now, it's going back to the, the map we saw before in the little area for the Presbyterian Church and what later became the Catholic Church. Um, a little bit of history about that. In, in 1850s, when the village of Irvington first was kind of grew and, and uh, was mapped out, a group of residents wanted to get together and establish the second, uh, a Presbyterian church. And they reached out to the Presbytery and they were able to establish what was then known as the second Presbyterian church of Greenberg. 
And shortly after the church was formed, Jabez and Olive Ellis gave the church a small parcel of land for a sanctuary on the east side of Broadway. And in the little map on this screen, you'll see that it's that area that has our Catholic church. That was the old Presbyterian church property. Uh, but in 1867, the second Presbyterian church was purchased property from Charles Tiffany on the west side of Broadway and built a newer and larger sanctuary. And that you'll see on this little map is the Presbyterian church on the west side, the left side of Broadway in this map. And so the, the church that had been on the east side was no longer being used. And in 1874, the Second Presbyterian Church sold its original property to Reverend John McCluskey, who was the Archbishop of New York. That actually took a little time to do. There had been a Catholic church that had been formed earlier in Irvington, and they were holding um, services in, in storefronts in Irvington, and they were looking for a, uh, a sanctuary. And a Reverend McGuire was made the, the new reverend for this new group of um, this church in, in Irvington. And he spotted this old property of the Presbyterian Church and sought to buy it. And the Presbyterian Church refused to sell it to him. I, I think there was probably a little bit of an undercurrent of anti-Catholicism at the time. And this, the church's story is that there was a young girl who had been going to their uh, schools and had converted to Catholicism. And she convinced her father, who was not in the church, to act as a front to buy the property. And the property was purchased from the Presbyterian Church, sold through several intermediaries, and ended up in the hands of John McCluskey. Um, and it was often at this time for church properties to be owned in the name of uh, Archbishop. And it was then later sold, and that became the home of the Church of the Immaculate Conception, as we know it today here in Irvington. And so this map is a map of um, Irvington as it existed in about 1880 to 1890. And I, I put this up to kind of show how all of these large estates were on the east side, and actually a little bit on the west side, but on the east side of Broadway. So just to orient yourself, the kind of pink vertical stripe that goes up and down, that's Broadway. And the pink roadway near the bottom, which on it has says Park Avenue, that is uh, what is today Harriman Road. And you'll see, uh, along, again, on the east side, on the right-hand side of Broadway, north of Harriman Road, were a series of very large estates owned by some of the most wealthy people in New York. Uh, J.H. Whitehouse, above that, Frederick Gateau, Above that, the large landowner of Elephant Wood, which later became the Rudder property. And above that, A.C. Richards' estate. And then north of that, the William Barton's estate, which was where Strawberry Hill was. And north of that, George Morgan of the Morgan family. And then the Cunningham estate, which reached all the way up to what became Sunnyside Lane. Now, a couple of interesting things about this map, the, the orange stripe that's down the middle of the map, that actually was the eastern boundary of the village when the village was originally incorporated in 1872. And so some of these estates were in the village, and, and the, but they extended out into the unincorporated parts of Greenberg as well. It wasn't, the, the second thing about this map is you'll see there's no Irvington Reservoir um, at this time. The reservoir was built in 1900 to provide fresh water to the growing village. And at that time, the eastern boundary of Irvington was extended east, almost out to, not quite to the Sawmill River, but almost. And, and then all of these uh, large estates all became part of Irvington formally. So Augustus Richard died in 1886. And uh, several years later, his executors sold his Irvington estate to Isaac Stern one of the owners of the Stern Brothers department store. And uh, the Stern Brothers department store had been founded in Buffalo in 1867 by Isaac Stern and his brothers, Louis and Benjamin Stern, all of whom were sons of German Jewish immigrants who had come to the United States. <clears throat> and in 1868, the brothers moved the business to New York City and quickly established themselves as kind of one of the leading merchants for dry goods in the city. And there were other stores, but the Stern brothers came in and made a big splash. They um, 
built this large store on 23rd Street. And in, in 1891, when Isaac Stern purchased his new Irvington estate, the old Richards farm, the Stern's brothers maintained one of the New York City's largest department stores. And again, it was located on West 23rd Street. And this is a picture of the Isaac, the Stern brothers department store on 23rd Street. This is between uh, Fifth Avenue and Sixth Avenue. Uh, you, the tall building you see on the left is what became the Flatiron Building. And you see in these pictures, all of these carriages sitting outside waiting to pick up people who are in shopping in the, the Stern store. Um, and this was the largest department store in New York, I think until either Macy's or Gimbel's opened up a, uh, a large store a little further north up in 30, 33rd Street, 34th Street. So Isaac Stern's purchase of his summer estate in Irvington was not always well accepted. Uh, and after purchasing the estate, he brought in some new workers to maintain the grounds and the building. It was, a, it was about a 90 acre estate and it had several barns and out, outside outbuildings and, and the old Richard's home, the Ridgeview home, and he needed a number of servants. And in July of 1892, he received a letter from something called the White Cap Committee, complaining about those Italians who had been brought in to work on his estate. And the White Cap Committee demanded these letter, that these workers be immediately discharged. And this is a copy of that letter that was sent to Isaac Stern, and I'm just gonna read it because I find it really interesting, kind of a, a capture of what was going on at the time. It says, Mr. Isaac Stern, sir, we wrote to you about seven or eight days ago about those Italians, and it seems you laughed at it. Well, now we want them and the man that is over them, uh, Colonel Kennedy, discharged tomorrow night or suffer the consequences. I should think that Mr. Knapper knew better than to bring them on the place. We will give him a call before it is all over. This is the last, so you can do as you, you, as, as you think best, and if this is not heated, you will hear from us personally. Yours respectfully, the White Cap Committee. So who was this White Cap Committee that was writing to Isaac Stern? Well, it, it, it shows a little bit of the underbelly of change that was going on in Irvington at the time. Uh, white capping was actually a widespread practice of vigilante justice that had expanded outward across the country from its origins in Indiana in the late 19th century. And white capping was a movement that was originally focused on the moral regulation of women and perceived degenerates. And it drew on anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic, anti-Semitic beliefs, and often it targeted poor whites and ne'er-do-wells who, who flouted what was seen to be traditional community standards. And in Irvington at this time, uh, during the late 19th century, a number of the local laborers in Irvington, many of whom were immigrants living in Little Dublin, which is today's East Irvington, were employed as servants and workers on the large estates of the wealthy families in Irvington. And this article on this slide is from uh, the New York Times in 1888, and it talks about this uh, experience of white caps in Westchester, specifically New Rochelle. And they were called white caps because they would people who were part of this committees would put on these muslin caps and cut eyes out and, and, and cover their faces. And the white caps were a, a symbolic of a number of vigilante movements that were in place around the country at this time and kind of were in between the Ku Klux Klan that had grown during Reconstruction in the 1860s and then died off. And then when the Ku Klux Klan came back in the 20s, during that interim period, a number of these uh, vigilante committees were out there complaining about immigration and, and, and again, the poor whites often. It's not clear what Isaac Stern did in response, if anything, to this letter, but I just think it's a, it's a really telling comment about how issues of immigration and uh, of prejudicial feelings have, were, prevalent at that time and have continued to reverberate through our community and our broader society uh, up until the present time. 
Um, so Isaac Stern, uh, in 1899, he purchased some additional property on the eastern edge of his property. And that kind of extended the footprint of his estate along Mountain Road. And then the following year, he renovated and updated the large home known as Ridgeview, which Augustus Richard had built in 1871 and 1873. And he converted the existing house into a large castle-like structure, which he christened um, Cedar Lawn. And two years later, he also built a large separate summer home on the hill in the middle of his property, which he called Rock Home. And that hill is the hill that exists today, which is now Dearman Park which is just above the middle school and high school and just to the um, east of the football field. Um, and that's where he built this large summer home. This is a picture of uh, his castle known as Cedar Lawn. Uh, this castle was situated on the hill uh, above Broadway uh, and again had this expansive view of all of the Hudson. Uh, this castle had 47 different rooms and supposedly, and I can't confirm this, there was a fireplace in almost every single room of this place. It was a gigantic home. Um, and this is a picture of Rock Home, which was what was deemed his summer home uh, in the middle of his property. And uh, they used the cedar, the family used Cedar Lawn and the Rock Home to both spend summers up here from their time in New York City. And they had a constant stream of guests who would come up and stay, which again was kind of a, a common thing for wealthy estates to have, to have guests come all summer long to take advantage of escaping the city. In 1906, Isaac Stern finally and permanently moved to Irvington from New York City, um, although he continued to commute to his office in New York City on his 200 foot steamer yacht, the Virginia. And he and a number of other large estate owners in Irvington maintained these gigantic yachts, which they would moor off of uh, the village of Irvington, right in the river. And in the morning, he would go down, take a carriage ride down, uh, get taken out to the boat or the ship or the yacht, and would sail down to New York would go to his office, spend the day there, and then sail back up. And uh, this yacht, the Virginia, was one of the biggest on the Hudson River. Um, after Stern's death, his family sold it to Frederick Vanderbilt, um, uh, Vanderbilt, and, uh, and then during World War I, it was leased to the federal government and rechristened the USS Vedette. It was used as a patrol, uh, patrol boat throughout the um, North Atlantic during the year. And this is a picture of it as it was then being sent back to the Vanderbilt family after World War I. Um, okay. Now, Isaac Stern uh, died in December 8th, 1910 in his New York City apartment. And under the terms of his will, his country estate, which was now this 94 acre estate, again, running from Broadway, out to Mountain Road was left to his wife, Virginia Stern, and to his 23-year-old son, Robert Stern. Now, Robert Stern had just graduated from Yale University that spring, which was the spring of 1910, and was about to begin his career as a banker in Europe, just as his father got sick and died actually in December of that year. Over the next few years, Virginia Stern and the Stern family continued to use Cedar Lawn as a summer retreat, and again, often inviting guests to stay in the castle or in the summer home, rock home, for extended periods. Robert Stern was a really interesting guy. Uh, after graduating from Yale, he, uh, that's, that summer, he briefly worked at Stern Brothers. And then after the death of his father, he began his career in banking in London and New York. And, uh, but in early 1917, uh, about seven years after he graduated from co uh, college, he changed his last name from Stern, S-T-E-R-N, to the anglicized Stearns, S-T-E-A-R-N-E-S. -E -E and it's possibly because of anti-German sentiment leading up to the United States entry into the war. Um, a number of sources indicate that Robert Stearns may have changed his name 
to Stearns because of his admiration for a guy named <coughs> Alfred Stearns, who was the headmaster at Phillips Academy um, in Andover, where uh, Robert Stern had gone as a high school student. Uh, and that's possible, but it was interesting. He didn't change his name till 11 years after he left Andover. And after he'd been traveling in Europe, and he actually had been arrested in Munich as a potential English spy. And so that experience, and also with the growing sentiment in the spring of 1917, about which led the United States to enter the World War, enter World War I, it could have been a combination of all that stuff. And he changed his name right before he married Bernice Marx, who was the daughter of a, the borough president of Manhattan, a very prominent politician in New York City. And you know, again, that may have been also one of the reasons why he changed his name. Now, Robert Stearns uh, continued on on Wall Street, and then in 1923, he formed the brokerage firm Bear Stearns with Joseph A. Bear and Harold C. Mayer. And as you know, Bear Stearns became one of the leading financial institutions on Wall Street for many, many, many years, all the way up to uh, the crisis in 2007 and 2008, uh, the financial crisis. So back to the Stearns estate. Uh, and again, I want to touch on a, a family that moved into the very Eastern part of the Stearns estate into a cottage that was on Mountain Road. In 1922, Santo and Annunciata Morabito and their children moved into the cottage at the East end of the Stearns estate, right along Mountain Road. And the Morabitos were Italian immigrants. They had come to Lower East Side and had lived on the Lower East Side for a number of years. Um, but two of their, they had a large family and two of their sons uh, died of pneumonia uh, because of the conditions in, in New York City. And so the family first moved up to Terrytown, stayed with some family members, and then moved over to Taxter Road, and then eventually moved to Mountain Road into the, this cottage that was on the Stearns Estate. And they were very poor, but very hardworking immigrants. Um, and they lived in the village for almost 60 years. And their family became very intertwined with a lot of activities within the village and were well known. The three of the boys, uh, Frank, Tony, and Fred, who were uh, you know, just beginning to their teenage years when they moved to Mountain Road, were responsible for taking care of the family cows. And each morning on the way to school, they would take the cows to graze in the Stearns apple orchard. And after school, they would return the cows to be milked and put in the barn. And the Stearns apple orchard where the Murabito cows graze is now the Irvington High School East Field, uh, which many of you know. And that was kind of this open apple orchard where both the Murabito cows were, and I think the Stearns also had cows on their large property. So, Virginia Stern, Isaac Stern's wife, and Roland Stern's mother died in 1927. And while Bear Stern survived the crash on Wall Street of 1929, because of financial pressures and the possibility of owing substantial estate taxes because of the death of Virginia Stern, in 1931, Robert B. Stearns and his wife sold the estate in Irvington to a corporation controlled by Leo Bing, who owned one of the um, largest real estate firms in New York City. Uh, three years later, however, Bing defaulted on his mortgage and the entire property was reconveyed to Robert B. Stearns. By this time, Robert Stearns had gotten divorced, so he, he owed it himself. Uh, he was then later remarried uh, in about 1939. And during World War II, the Stearns continued to use their property uh, but they also offered parcels at Cedar Lawn to local residents to plant victory gardens and sponsored yearly contests for the best garden vegetables. And for, you know, for those of you who remember victory gardens, during World War II, there was a big push to have people grow their own vegetables. And here in Irvington, the Stearns Estate, the Nevis Estate, and the Tiffany Estate offered land for people to come and create little garden plots to make their vegetables. And, just a reflection of the Stearns' involvement in their communities, in their community of Irvington. Um, but the end of World War II brought change. 
The Stearns family had continued to occupy the Cedar Lawn Castle overlooking Broadway until 1942. And yet they, and while they continued to fund the e upkeep of the Cedar Lawn Castle for several more years, by 1950, it was just too expensive and the Grand Castle was kind of abandoned and left to deteriorate. The Stearns continued to use the summer home, which is the middle of property called Rock Home, as a summer retreat from time to time. But they began to spend much more of their summers at Kiahawa, their camp in the northern Adirondacks. They had this gigantic camp, which was again kind of the, the rave of very wealthy families in New York in the 30s and the 40s to buy large pieces of property in Adirondacks and treat them as camps where they would spend much of the summer. Uh, beginning in the, in the late 1940s, there were negotiations with the Church of Immaculate Conception about purchasing some more a, a part of the Western estate of the Stearns estate along Broadway, but those negotiations were not successful. They, they couldn't reach a common ground on that. And so the Church of Immaculate Conception, again, was left to its little narrow piece of property that it had been on uh, now since the 1870s. But within the village, there was a lot of post-war pressure for growth. Uh, in, the 18, in the 1950s, Irvington's population uh, grew. Demand for housing grew. There were new apartment complexes being built. The Half Moon uh, condominiums along South, Buc South Buckout were built at this time. The uh, apartment buildings on the corner of Hamilton and Broadway on the northeast corner were built. And they uh, were kind of a new phenomena for the village, these, these kind of apartments. And there were rumors that the Stearns were planning a 75 family apartment project on their property right along Broadway, the western side of their property that fronted Broadway. And this is an editorial from the Irvington Gazette uh, from September of 1953 talking about these changes and referring to these new apartment complexes. And the editorial was actually uh, unhappy about the fact that these new apartment developments were being put in place. And they were a big proponent of having single family construction, but they recognized that the cost of single family construction, single family homes was very high, and you could only build those homes in certain parts of the village. Um, and you know, at this part of the village, uh, the homes along what be, what became Riverview Road had been built in the late twenties. Uh, the homes in Cedar Hill had been built again in the very late twenties, but there were a lot of still open areas of the village that had not yet been developed, and the tension between building single-family homes <coughs> and more apartment buildings or multifamily homes was at was at play then. And it, again, as if anybody's been involved with recent discussions, is still a bit of an issue in today's Irvington as well. So the Stern family um, decided ultimately to break up the Stern's estate. Robert Stern's, who had been Isaac Stern's son, he died in December of 1954, and he left the, the Stern's property, which was in Irvington, which again was about 94 acres of property, to his second wife, Margaret Stern's, and to his son, Roland Stern's. And uh, in 1956, Margaret Stearns and her son, Roland Stearns, start to sell off some of the small lots on the very northeastern corner of their property along Mountain Road. And today, a number of those lots, as you go from up Mountain Road past the Riverview Road, the lots on the right, that used to be part of the Stearns estate, and they're now, but they were now sold off to individual homeowners. And in 1956, Roland Stearns and his wife, his new wife, Joyce, purchased from Roland's mother the 16-acre hilltop parcel surrounding the summer home of Rockhold. And uh, that became kind of their summer estate. Um, and this is, a, I, I, this is a really interesting uh, kind of a capture and picture of what was going on at the times. This is, uh, although they, had sp they continued to spend a lot of time up in the family's camp in Northern Adirondacks, Roland and Joyce Stern continue to use entertain guests at Rockholm throughout the summers. And this is a book uh, about James Rosenquist. And James Rosenquist 
was an artist, uh, a young artist, who later in the 1960s and 1970s became a well-known leading artist of the pop art uh, movement uh, throughout New York, throughout the world. And he had been studying art as a young student at the Art Students League between 1955 and 1956. And he had been living an art student's life. He was at, living in, uh, I think, near Columbus Circle for $8 a week, which is not very much. And uh, in, he left the Art Students League in the spring of 1856 and was kind of looking what to do next and how to continue to study art. And um, a friend of his told him about this crazy couple up in Irvington who needed, who were willing to give him a job. And I want to read, if I can, just a brief part of his, uh, an interview of James Rosenquist, which was done in, uh, I think, uh, I think 2012 at the Museum of Modern Art, where he was talking about this period of his life. Then my friend Ron Donarski in the school said, Jim, I know of a great job. You stay in a millionaire, millionaire's house in Irvington, New York, and they have great food. That was the big attraction, was food. So he went up there, and this girl jumped out of the house wearing Bermuda shorts with her gin and tonic. She says, come on, boys, jump in my wildcat, and I'll show you the castle. And it was Joyce Stearns. They had a big castle on their property from, from the Stearns family. And these people, his father, Roland's father, put an A in his name and started Bear Stearns Stock Brokerage Company. So she said, well, do you want the job? And I said, we'll have to think about it. We thought about it for two minutes, and I said, I'd take it. So I went to work for them, and I liked them. I liked the people, that they were young and fun. And Roland, when he was 30, uh, I, I carved a big bust of him on ice and a big punch bowl at one of his parties. On his 30th birthday back in 56, he got his first $16 million from his father's estate. That's a lot of money in 1956. Anyway, I stayed there one year and I thought, this isn't my house, this isn't my place. I drove, I was a chauffeur and a bartender, and one cocktail party, who shows up? John Chamberlain, who was a famous sculptor, Romy Bearden, uh, who did a lot of Afro-American art, and Superman or George Reeves. And that was kind of a, I think, I just, I love that quote. It's just kind of a, a capture of life in the 50s at the, the Stearns estate in Irvington. And you'll see on the right-hand side, that's a picture of uh, James, Jim Rosenquist doing a headstand on the Stearns premium, Lincoln premium convertible at their house in 1956. So uh, uh, for many years, I said but earlier, the leadership of the Church of Immaculate Conception had dreamed of extending its property along Broadway. And finally, in July of 1956, Margaret Stearns and Roland Stearns finally agreed to sell the 4.2 acre parcel along North Broadway to the church so it could expand its campus. And that is the property of Immaculate Church of, uh, the Church of Immaculate Conception today. And the church immediately began planning to build a new school to replace the small parochial school on its original property. And this is a picture of that new school, which was built. This was probably uh, taken in 1958 or 1959. And what's interesting about this photograph is that you can see above the tree line, the very top of what was the Stearns Castle. That's the crenellated top portion of the turret of the castle that extended above the tree line. And the little roadway on the right where that little truck is, that was the roadway up to what at that time was the church. And the church was further up the hill behind the house you see there on the right. The house you see on the right is what is known today as the Vic, which was the old church rectory for the church. The, the cathedral that was further up the road from the, the, that house um, later burned down. And the Church of Mount Conception built uh, their current church and cathedral over on the, just to the right, I mean, just to the left in that kind of grassy area that would later become the church grounds uh, for the church as we know it today. So in late uh, 1956, the Stearns proposed that the planning board approve a plan to subdivide 32 acres of the Stearns property immediately to the east of the area that is now owned by the Church of Mount Conception. And several months later, they sold this 32-acre parcel to a developer. 
But two years later, that developer defaulted and after not being able to build. And, and after they defaulted, the Stearns foreclosed and brought the property back, repurchased the property. So they made another run at this. In um, 1860, uh, Roland Stearns proposed to the village that it change the zoning of the Stearns property so that the abandoned Cedar Lawn Castle, which we saw above those trees, could be renovated and turned into a, a, a grand restaurant. Uh, there was a restaurant developer, Roy French, who was planning to do all this, but he ultimately decided not to pursue this and to build in Terrytown and not in Irvington. So this plan also died on the vine. So the Stearns were struggling what to do with all these big expanse of, and expensive expanse of property that they held. So in July 14th, 1862, the Stearns Castle, which again, Cedar Lawn, was suddenly heavy dam heavily damaged by fire. And the fire was discovered at 5 a.m. in the morning. Uh, and by the time the fire had burned itself out, only the stone walls of the structure remained, like some battered castle overseas in which it was modeled. Um, I don't think they ever discovered the cause of uh, the fire. Um, this was not the first time a fire had been lit in this castle, however. A couple of years earlier, there had been a mattress that had been soaked in gasoline left in the, in the castle lit on fire that was put out. Um, whether this was a suspicious fire or not, that's an open question, uh, but it, it essentially destroyed this castle and, and changed the, how this, what this property was, could be or would be in the future. Finally, the following year, Margaret now Stearns, now Francisco, she had remarried, and Roland Stearns conveyed to the Union Free School District the western portion of the Stearns property, this 32-acre property, so that the school district could build a new high school. And, and this is the property which, where today the high school is, and now the middle school. And at that time, the school was located on Main Street, and they have this kind of a state that they could have this new uh, large high school and middle school was a tremendous move, again, because of the growing population in the village. Um, now, in, they were still using the Rockholm uh, uh, summer house that was in the middle of this property, but in 1966, it was struck by lightning and extensively damaged. And this is an article about that. It was, um, it was a, I think, a Saturday afternoon, or a Tuesday afternoon, excuse me, and their daughter, Bonnie, was in the house when lightning struck. And uh, the, they were able to put the fire out, but it heavily damaged the roof and damaged the upper floors. They they're able to save a lot of the valuables in the house, but it was a it really set that back as a place where the family could use as a summer retreat going forward. So Roland Stearns, who had remarried at this point, was spending most of his time up in the Adirondacks and was not spending little not spending much time, if any, at his Irvington estate. And so finally, in 1978, the Stearns sold their interest in the Stearns property to a group of developers who planned to build 40 to 60 homes in the property. And again, this is the property that was north and east of the, where today the high school is that extended out to Mountain Road. And the plan this developer had was to build a whole stretch of large homes stretching from the high school out to Mountain Road. And this began a contentious 25-year effort to develop the eastern half of the Stearns property. So from 1878, I mean 1978 to 1984, uh, the, the developer who owned the property at that time was called Riverview Investors. And they appeared before the planning board and with a plan to build 60 homes, um, as I said, north and east of the high school. But right at this time, however, the village approved the 1979 Comprehensive Land Use Plan, which was the first large revised Comprehensive Land Use Plan the village had created for the entire village. And one thing it specifically provided that woodlands in the village and other scenic resources, such as the reservoir and surrounding areas, should be protected and preserved. And at this time, the east, very eastern portion of the Stearns property was all wooded, it was woodlands. And so this suddenly put a crimp on the push to develop that property. And 
By 1891, Riverview Investors decided to put a hold on its plan. It was getting nowhere with the planning, planning board. And finally, in late 1981, Riverview Investors suddenly proposed to the village that it would donate the eastern 20 acres of the Stearns property to the village, subject to a life estate granted to Mary and Mildred Morabito. And Mary and, and Mildred Morabito were the daughters of the Morabito family, and they still lived in the same cottage that their family had moved into in 1922. They were two single, they had never gotten married, um, and they lived there by themselves, and they were pretty old. And so uh, the offer was that we'll let them live there for the rest of their lives, and that property will go to the village, and the village accepted um, this offer. Now, it, you know, this, is, this in many ways was a grand gesture by these, in, these uh, developer, but it, in reality, much of the parcel they gave to the village was wetlands. It was part of the, what are today the hermit wetlands, and they knew they couldn't develop this anyways. And so in many ways, they were kind of unloading onto the village this, pars this part of the property that um, would, not would not be able to have houses built on it, and that was kind of dead weight for the developers. But it still gave the village this 20 acres in the very eastern portion of, uh, of what became the Irvington Woods. So in late 1984, a new developer purchased the Stern property, and they came up with a new proposal to build 36 units closer to the high school with access to Broadway, and then 13 homes on the eastern part of the site, which would be accessed through Mountain Road. But during this time, there was a growing concern within the village that the entire character of Irvington was being threatened by proposed development. And, uh, and right at this time, the Rudder property at the top of, Mount, of Main Street was sold for development, as was, as was the property surrounding Halsey Pond. And the Rudder property, if you remember that map we looked at before, that is what ultimately became Field Point. And that was a real shock for a lot of people. That was this kind of open expanse as you came up mountain you came up Main Street, you could often see cows uh, up on the hill above Main Street. And to have that property sold off for development was a big shock. And the area around Halsey Pond was purchased by Hearts Associates and they suddenly wanted to build homes all around Halsey Pond. And that effort was fought by a group form called the Irvington Rockfall Association, which was led by Dr. Martin Healy, who lived up at Havermere Lane. And it was named after a large, but now largely forgotten rockfall that still exists uh, a little southwest of where uh, Halsey Pond is today. But because of their efforts, the development of houses right around Halsey Pond was blocked and, and never in fact happened. So in 18, I'm 1989, in part of the, as a result of this new land use comprehensive plan, uh, the, the village passed a local law number three, which specifically protected the reservoir watershed. And this is a map of the eastern section of Irvington, and you'll see the Irvington Reservoir, and Harriman Road goes around south around the reservoir. And the watershed is the parts where water flow flows down into that reservoir. And it extends up to Mountain Road, uh, and extends even further north up to where at this point, Riverview Road was. And a large part of that is what is the eastern part of the Stearns estate um, at the time. And so this also substantially changed the calculus for how and what you could develop on that property. In 1991, a new developer called named Westwood Associates purchased Stearns property and, and they sued the village over these new zoning laws. And after three years of litigation, Westwood and the village settled that outstanding litigation. And as part of that settlement, they agreed to designate and swap certain parcels on the Stearns property. So certain parcels that it was owned by Westwood would be given to the village, and certain part of that portion of the village property, the very east, which the village had gotten in 1981, would be swapped back to Westwood. So Westwood could build houses on some of that. Westwood agreed to propose a development of only 47 single family homes. And the village agreed to modify its zoning uh, regulations to make it, to give more discretion to the planning board. 
And by 2001, Westwood had received preliminary approval to build up to 38 homes on this swath of the northern sec, the eastern section of the Stearns property at the northern end of what will later become the Irvington Woods. But there was still a growing concern within the village. There's a growing concern about the loss of open space that was happening. And in the summer of 2000, there were a number of proposed development projects that would impact and would frankly take away what a lot of that open space was. One of that was the Westwood development. And another one was the possible development of homes along Cyrus Field Road. And, and that development, which would later become Legend Hollow, also raised a lot of concerns with the village. And at the suggestion of Nikki Coddington, uh, in September of 2000, the village board approved a proposed bond resolution providing for the acquisition of open space in the amount of $3 million subject to a village-wide refer referendum. And that was a lot of money. That was a lot of money to go to village residents to ask them to pay the cost of. Um, and it was a very short window of time to advocate for the passage of this bond resolution between September, I think it was September 18th that the board passed this resolution and early November when the referendum would be put to a vote at the same time of all the other elections going on at the time. And so uh, one of the trustees, Garrett Beattie, asked Nikki and Pat Betterman uh, to uh, create a, a, an, or an organization within the village to kind of promote this open end uh, space referendum. And they, they created the Irvington Open Space Alliance. Uh, and this, the top part of this is a caption of a flyer that they use to kind of promote this. And, and these two pictures here, the bottom left one is of Carolyn Nimchek and Nikki Coddington and Paul Galay. And Carolyn, as many of you know, lived on the Murray Estate uh, along South Broadway. And Carolyn was very involved with these efforts and very connected into uh, uh, a number of organizations that were able to potentially provide funding for this effort. And Paul Galay was the, at that time, the president of the Westchester Land Trust, who was also very supportive of this effort to preserve open space. And then the picture on the right is also of Carolyn, and that's um, Garrett Beeney, who was a trustee, and as you'll hear, was pivotal in, pivotal in the efforts to protect and preserve open space in the village. Um, and the referendum passed overwhelmingly. Uh, it, um, one of the highest passage rates in, among all the referendums that are going on in Irvington at this time. I, go, I mean, in Westchester at this time. And it was due to the hard work of the Open Space Alliance. And then in early 2001, um, the, uh, the village created a new 12-member Open Space Advisory Committee, which was, which was chaired by Jan Blair. Uh, and for those of you who know who Jan, Jan had long been involved in environmental causes. In the, in the village and was very knowledgeable about this. And the Open Space Advisory Committee was responsible for setting priorities based on the existing open space in the village. Back in 1993, the village had created an open space inventory and had created a list of all the areas of undeveloped property, both publicly owned and privately owned. And in, 2000, in the summer of 2001, the new Open Space Advisory Committee use the criteria, and this is the list of criteria that they used, to look at every single property in that list and to evaluate whether it, uh, what kind of uh, priority it should have in terms of trying to save that as open space so they could come back and advise the Environmental Conservation Board about those issues. And the Open Space Advisory Committee, after this long process, uh, ranked the Westwood property as a top priority for protection. So that gave a lot more impetus to try and work on saving this Westwood property from development. And that led to lengthy negotiations with Westwood Associates that were led by Trustee Garrett Beeney. And in December of 2001, the Village Board authorized the mayor to execute an option agreement to acquire several tracts of the Westwood property for open space preservation. And the total price for this property would be $6.85 million, a lot of money, of which $3 million was a down payment. And some of that money was gonna come from village money, some from state money, some from county money. And the rest would be due at closing if the option was exercised. And if the, 
village exercised its options, the parties would carry out some of the property swap, but the village would own would end up owning a large portion of the eastern section of the Stearns property that they um, that they would then preserve as open space. And Westwood, for its part, continued to press forward with its proposal to develop what they called Track A, which was the area on the hill above the high school field. And this is a map of Track A of the Westwood property that, as part of this, under this option agreement, this big negotiation negotiated deal, Westwood could could continue to develop. And this area is what is today known as Deerman Park, which is the set of homes on the hill above the high school field and above um, the high school. And uh, a couple of things to note on this map. One is you'll see that there's at least a, a showing of a roadway that would cut down to Field Point Drive. And one of the big debates about the development of this property was how it would be accessed, whether it would be accessed out through the road that led through the high school down to Broadway, which the high school controlled and was involved in these negotiations, or whether it would lead out through um, Field Point out to Harriman Road, out by the reservoir. As we know, it ultimately ended up being accessed through the high school, but the remnants of that potential roadway between Deerman Park and Field Point still exists on the high school property. The other thing is that little, that, that large open area in the middle of this map, that is where the Rock Home Summer House was. That home had been sold to a family in 1979 by an earlier developer. And that Rock Home House is still there. It was there and, and is still there today. Um, and it's a, it's a big, beautiful home right in the middle of what is today uh, Deerman Park. So finally, in May of 29, May 29, 2003, uh, the day after the uh, county board of legislators authorized the county to put money into this, the trustees authorized the village to exercise this option under the option agreement. And approximately at the same time, the village approved the 2003 comprehensive plan, which was an update of the 79 comprehensive plan which was based on the overarching goals of managing growth while preserving the village's natural and scenic resources. And that 2000 plan, 2003 plan identified the reservoir and its watershed as having natural resource significance because of their biodiversity. And it's interesting that those principles uh, about preserving open space in the 2003 conference of plan have continued on and were part of the 2000 19 update or 2018 update of the village uh, comprehensive plan in the last year or two. And those continue to be part of what are important principles in our village. And the village entered into agreements with the County of Westchester, the Open Space Institute and Scenic Hudson Land Trust for funding to complete the acquisition to pay off the entire $6.85 million. And a condition of these agreements was that the village would dedicate its newly acquired park property as parkland. And so the transaction closed in December of 2003 and the village acquired approximately 27 acres of woodlands that now makes up the northern sections of the urban two woods. A tremendous uh, commitment by the village to preserve this open wooded area. And uh, uh, about a year later, uh, the Open Space Advisory Committee created a trails committee and it was headed by Rich Goldman, many of you know and others uh, to identify and preserve a system of trails through the entire Irvington Woods. And in this photograph, that is a photograph, the woman standing on the left, that's Nikki Coddington. And sitting on the bench in the middle is Peter Ole, who uh, was a longtime historian in the village and a big proponent of the trails through the Irvington Woods. And the woman sitting next to him with a pack on her back you'll see that sticking out of that pack is this yellow stick with this kind of white thing on the top. And that was the GIS system that was used, GPS system, excuse me, that was used at the time to map the trail. She would basically would walk all the trails and it would track on this kind of big clunky thing in that pack. And that was how they would be able to draw the trails on the map for the new um, Irvington Woods. 
And after Peter's death in 2010, the trail system was formally became the Peter Oley Trailways system. And that's what it is today. Now, even after the village had acquired the Westwood property in 2003, however, parts of that property and unfortunately much of the rest of the Irvington Woods were not actually protected from future development. They were simply owned, they were simply open property that was owned in fee by the village, which a later group of trustees could decide to sell and sell off the developers. So therefore, in February of 2018, the Greater Irvington Land Trust and the Open Space Advisory Committee uh, researched all that history and then jointly petitioned the trustees to formally dedicate the village-owned portions of the Irvington Woods as parkland. If that by doing that, under the public trust doctrine, which is a common law doctrine in New York, once property is formally dedicated as public parkland, it cannot be sold or used for another purpose without getting legislation passed in Albany, allowing that to happen, which is very hard to do. So it eventually, it, it, what it does is essentially protect this type of property from future development, or future sale, or any use other than as park. And to the village's credit, with the input from the Recreation and Parks Department, the Board of Trustees agreed, and in 2019, it formally dedicated the unprotected parts of the Irvington Woods as parkland. And by this step, the village of Irvington now has one of the largest protected woodland parks in Southern Westchester. And that again is a tremendous, tremendous part of what our community is today. The fact that all of these people over this period of time fighting with Westwood, trying to find funding, it ebbed and flowed, but it was successfully resulted in, in our village having one of the largest parks in Southern Westchester. However, that led to the need for building a nature center. As part of the Westwood transaction in 2003, the village of Irvington had entered into an intermunicipal agreement with the county of Westchester, under which the county agreed to fund three million bucks. And there were a bunch of conditions in that agreement. And one of the conditions was that a building to be operated as a nature center, um, uh, open to all county residents, shall be operated and maintained by the village during the terms of this agreement on approximately one acre of property. Now, I've been told by several people that it was a little unclear during the planning and the negotiations of these agreements what exactly this nature center would be, how it would be funded, and how it would be used, but it was something that the Westchester County wanted and it was thrown into the deal and had to be made part of the deal. The original idea was to take what had been the existing Morabito Cottage, which is pictured here, and make that into this new nature center. And this is a picture of the Morabito Cottage right from Mountain Road. And you'll see that the gateway to the cottage still shows it called Cedar Lawn. And uh, this was taken in 2008, but unfortunately the Morabito Cottage was not in great shape. It had very small little rooms. And frankly, they quickly realized that it, it would be very difficult to make that into a nature center. The other big challenge was, even though the village had committed to building a nature center, it didn't have any funding in its budget for this project. And after several years of lobbying, in 2008, Congresswoman Nita Lowy secured a Department of Energy grant for $239,000, which could be used on this project, but it had to be spent within two years. And originally this grant as structured had been, it was written to say, well, we're gonna use that money to renovate the Morabito house. But once they really examined it and realized that couldn't be done, they said they had to come up with something new. So the village staff worked very hard to come up with a proposal that would fit within that budget but was only able to propose kind of a modular pre-manufactured type building. Um, but fortunately for everyone, all the village, uh, John Malone, who was an architect at Earl Ferguson's firm here in the village, offered to design the Nature Center's building on a volunteer basis, creating a design that would promote sustainable practices and use, and use passive solar energy to assist in the heating and cooling, which was a big element that people wanted to be part of this, um, part of this Nature Center. And this is a design that John and Earl and uh, uh, architects came up with. It was a simple but very elegant design that fits well into the surrounding landscapes. Um, it incorporated a number of uh, design elements around passive heating and cooling and included a large meeting classroom that supports the Nature Center's purpose as kind of a place of discovery and of learning. Now, 
building this nature center is, I think, a great story. It's a, it's a real community effort and, and, and under the leadership of a lot of people. Uh, Larry Schaffer, who is the village administrator, Ed Marin, who was the building inspector, and some key residents, Peter Kopp, Bob Munigal, and David Zweibel, they were kind of led a small working group committee to oversee how do we tear down the existing Morabito house and construct a whole new nature center with only $239,000, which was really not enough money. And they went out uh, and through the good work of especially Ed, convinced a lot of local residents and local contractors to do put in hundreds of hours of volunteer time and to provide heavy equipment and operators at little or no cost to allow the village to both tear down the Morabito house and build this new nature center with little or no labor costs. And uh, it was a, really a tremendous effort. But while the volunteers were able to raise and complete and close the shell of the building, the existing funding was just not enough to complete the interior space and purchase fixtures and furnishings. And so they were stuck with this building that was enclosed, but the interior was not done and they just didn't have any further funding. But at the same time, they had tremendous volunteers throughout the village. And this is a series of pictures of some of the work that was done on the land around the new nature center, clearing of brush and laying of compost and, and the like. And I, I think uh, a bunch of kids uh, in the bottom picture on the left, you see with holding the branches. I think that's Brian Smith, who is now our mayor. There were a lot of people who put hard work in and just volunteered their time to do this. And this is a list of donations by local contractors and village personnel, which the village gave me to look at. And it just shows all of the people who did so much to contribute toward this effort. And, um, you know, from John and Earl, uh, Joe DiNardo, uh, Peter Cobb, Joe Galano, uh, Brian uh, Gizzi, Chris Giampaolo, Carl Dibble, Jeff Tilly, Joe Clark. Frank Rocanelli, and then a whole bunch of people who worked for the village uh, put their time and an effort in. And this really allowed the village in a real positive way to kind of create this nature center. But they were still short of funds. They couldn't, didn't have enough money to possibly complete the center in a way that would make it a usable space. And so faced with this, um, Irvington resident Rick Rusulo, many of you know Rick, uh, suggested approaching the O'Hara Foundation. Now, the, the O'Hara Foundation had been created as a way to memorialize Jack and Janet O'Hara and their daughter, Caitlin, who were Irvington residents, but were tragically killed in the explosion of TW-800 on July 17, 1996. And as many of you remember, that was, a, that was a plane that had taken off from Kennedy, was heading toward Europe, and blew up off the southern shore of Long Island because of a spark in one of its, I believe it was in one of its tanks. And Jack and Janet O'Hara and Caitlin were well known and, and kind of great members of the community. And they had two younger sons and uh, Jack's brother, Jim and, and his wife, Peg, moved to Irvington and to basically raise those two sons. And they, although they later moved to Rockland County, they continue to have a strong connection to the village of Irvington and, and created the O'Hara Foundation basketball tournament. Caitlin had been a big basketball player. Uh, and I think, I think Jim was, I mean, Jack was her coach. And that became a wonderful thing in our village for years that, that uh, ran for I think 15 years. But at that time, uh, because of the Nature Center uh, and Rick's suggestion, Joe Archino and Mayor John Siegel at the time met with the O'Hara family uh, uh, and talked about the need and they immediately offered to assist. Kind of remarkable, quick decision they made to provide a substantially and very timely gift. And that gift by the O'Hara Foundation allowed the Nature Center to be completed. It was a really remarkable thing they did. So what's the O'Hara Nature Center today? Um, under the leadership of the staff of the Irvington Rec, the Parks Department, the O'Hara Nature Center has really flourished. It, and, you know, in many ways, it's because it's on Mountain Road, a lot of people in the village don't go over there. And, and I think, frankly, there's a lot of new people coming to the village that don't really know it's there. But it is a tremendous resource for all of us. 
And one of the first things they did was they realized they wanted to create demonstration gardens uh, around the nature center as a way of showing what the nature center could be. And uh, uh, so about 10 demonstration gardens were designed by a number of folks in the village on a volunteer basis. And then uh, they solicited funds by other village residents to, to basically pay to build those gardens and put plantings in there. And these demonstration gardens, for those of you who have not seen them lately, they're just a beautiful part of what the Nature Center is today. And this is a picture of the Zero Scape Garden, which was originally designed by Ann Asherson and is now maintained by the village horticulturists, C.J. Riley and Peter Strom, who work to maintain all of the grounds of the Nature Center. And it's really a place of just, I think, real beauty. Uh, these are some pictures of some of the gardens. Again, the bottom left is a zero scape garden. The right one is the butterfly garden. And the one above is the um, rain garden. And then that's a picture of the um, nature center today after a quick snowfall. Again, a beautiful, beautiful place. The nature center is also today a real center for learning. Uh, in the bottom left, there's a picture of Peter Strom and C.J. Riley, who are great guys. They are hired by the village and they do a lot of the horticultural work, but C.J. also, and with Peter's help, does a lot of the educational resources, developing those resources uh, at the Nature Center. And in the bottom left, I mean, upper left corner, that is a uh, chart of about uh, one of the pollinator hotels that they have promoted and built on the property. And the bottom right is a kind of a set of materials put together by CJ, which describes all the plants in each of the 10 demonstration gardens. And you can find these on the Irvington Woods Committee website. And they're a tremendous resource about each and every plant that's in the gardens, what they need to grow, where, what their genesis is, what their names are. Uh, and it's just, it's a remarkable resource that we all take advantage of. And the O'Hara Nature Center has become a real open air classroom. Uh, again, in the bottom left corner, you'll see what has been built last summer as the open air classroom that uh, uh, it's this gorgeous place for giving open air classes. It's been a little hard to, it's been, a, you can't use it during this kind of recent pandemic, but it is something that, again, once this pandemic resides, will really be a great addition to our to our uh, rec department and our entire community. Upper left, that's the campfire girls working on pollinator hotels. And an interesting thing on the bottom right, you'll see there's a little girl in front of one of the gardens and on that fence post is a square which names the garden but also has a QR code. And the QR code, you see that's one of them in this picture of the pollinator hotel in the upper left. That QR code, um, if you put your camera up to that code, uh, it takes you to a website and gives you information about every single plant in every single garden. And every single garden at the O'Hare Nature Center has one of these QR codes on it. And so you can just walk around and learn about every single plant that's up there. And I think ultimately the plan is to build and put in these uh, QR codes throughout the Irvington Woods as a way of really creating a guidepost for people to take advantage of what these woods are for everybody. And probably most important, the Our Nature Center is really kind of creating a lasting legacy for our, our community. And uh, this last spring, notwithstanding the pandemic and notwithstanding the social system that had to be done, uh, the uh, CJ and Peter, and I believe some of the uh, rec department staff have been able to do a long plan tree planting and shrub planting project around the Nature Center. And this is a map of the Nature Center showing the planting of all these different trees. And they planted over 75 native trees and 150 native shrubs uh, in the land. And these add not only diversity of plant life for the Irvington Woods, but are a food source for pollinators and such as songbirds and a wide variety of insects. And I think it's just emblematic of kind of thinking back to all the hard work of all these volunteers over the years which led to this nature center. And now this nature center is continuing to give back to the community by ensuring the biodiversity of the area of the woods and preserving the woods and preserving the flora of the woods. It's, it's just a, it's a great example of what 
people in this community can do. And I'm just very proud of them. So uh, a couple final notes. You know, our community has been tested by pan the pandemic, as everybody has. Um, but there's still things that we need support of. And, and I just want to call out two of them to everybody on the phone or on a Zoom call today. One is the ongoing and effort by the Irvington Rec to deliver food for seniors. And for those of you who know about this project, it's a really important one. For those who don't know about it, you should. Uh, twice a week, the Irvington Rec delivers food to seniors all across the village, people who have been, you know, shut in because of the pandemic and not able to go to stores. And it's really a tremendous connection for a lot of people who would otherwise be very isolated in their homes. And another thing I want to call out for is giving uh, the Irvington Volunteer Ambulance Corps, which throughout this entire pandemic has continued to serve our community and make sure that people who are ill can be, are, can be picked up and, and, and get medical care, emergency medical care, and if necessary, be taken to hospitals. And all the other essential workers who work so hard for all of us to keep our village strong and vibrant, they all need our support. <clears throat> so that's my talk today. We're going to have a Q&A session in a minute. But before I turn to that, I wanted to just note for everybody that we're going to continue doing these Zoom presentations. Our next one is by uh, Dr. Neil Ma uh, Meher, as you, who's somebody well known in the village. Uh, he's going to be talking on the Great Depression and Franklin Roosevelt in the Hudson Valley and talk about the Civil Conservation Corps and how it's impact in this whole region. That's going to be in September, September 20th at 2 p.m. And, and I will be sending out reminders about um, that uh, going forward. So for those of you who have questions, and uh, I'm going to do it, the way you can, you can uh, ask a question, if you go down to, I think, the bottom of your screen, There'll be a black banner there and there'll be a thing that says uh, participants. If you click on that participants, you'll see on the right hand side a little place where you can raise your hand. And if you have a question you'd like to ask, you can touch that button and raise your hand and, and I'm more than willing to give my shot at trying to answer questions. Uh, so does, I don't know if anybody has any questions about anything we talked about today, but I'd be more than pleased to answer them if you do. Let me see if anybody pops up or not. Uh, well, no one seems to be doing that. So perhaps everyone's questions have been answered. Uh, oh, I think Edna might be, Edna, do you have a question? No, I just wanted to say what a great bunch of information you gave us. You always are so well researched. And it's always a pleasure, and I look forward to hearing you speak always. Thank you for what you've done. Well, thank you very much. I have to say that a, a large part of this, a good part of this talk today, I had the pleasure of interviewing a lot of people who were really part and parcel of this effort with the Nature Center. And it's just so interesting to talk to my neighbors and friends about this effort that was done. It's really pretty incredible. So thank you, Ed. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, any other questions by anybody? Um, if well, it looks like no one has any questions, oops. Uh, and I do have a question from uh, Anna uh, yes. White. And uh, so, Anna, I'm going to unmute you. Let's see if I can do that. One second. There you go. Okay, so, I'm anybody have a question? Yeah, thank you. This, this was wonderful as, as always. Um, my question is, um, I live in Sleepy Hollow at Kendall on Hudson, and we have a horticulture committee that has expressed interest in visiting the nature center, but we're concerned about the, the terrain for seniors to navigate. And I'm wondering if you can give some insights about how um, it's made as accessible as possible to people with walkers, for example. So I think that, uh, and so Anna, you should, and excuse me, Anne, you should, to get a real clear uh, message, you, you should reach out to the Irvington Rec who can, can guide you through this process. However, the, um, I think parts of the property are, are accessible, even people with walkers. 
some of the gardens may be harder to access. And so you may not be able to walk around the entire property. But I, the, if, if you drive into the space, there's a parking lot and there's a walkway up to the building, which is very easily accessible. It's uh, ADA accessible. And you go into the building, you can look out its window and see the rest of the gardens. But in the, in the front, there are several of the gardens right along the front. And I think that uh, with care, people could, even with walkers, would be able to go right up to the garden and see them. And they're very beautiful and very nice to do. So I think there's an opportunity to do it. You may not be able to see all of the grounds because some of it is hilly and rocky, but there'll be, I think you could be able to see enough of it to really see the beauty of it all has, okay? Thank you. Okay, great. Any other questions by anybody? Well, I'm gonna assume that no, I, that my talk answered everyone's questions and that's great. But if anybody does have any future questions, you can always email me. Um, but again, I want to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, I really appreciate you all being here and learning a little about this history. And, um, and I hope you all look forward to our next uh, talk, which will be on September 20th, uh, which you'll get information about. So thank you and uh, my best everybody today.